there was one name that dominated the Cineplex during the 1990s. James Cameron. He had Terminator 2, True Lies, and Titanic all raking in cash and critical acclaim. However, there was almost a very different film in Cameron's 90s output, one that featured a very familiar face, your friendly neighborhood, Spider-Man. Spider-Man was always my main man growing up, and uh, I actually I actually rescued that that uh, project from the from the kind of the ash heap. Currently, Spider-Man's adventures have been ruling the big screen for close to 20 years. But it wasn't always this way. Spidey has been adapted multiple times to the small screen, but the feature film side of Spidey's career had been mired in false starts and missed opportunities. Prior to Cameron coming on board, Spider-Man was being marshaled at Canon Films under the watchful and usually inept eye of schlocky super producer Menachem Golan. However, Canon Films was undergoing financial problems and before anyone knew it, Canon was out and the rights to Spider-Man were auctioned off. In 1990, Carol Co. purchased the rights to make a Spidey feature film from Menachem Golan for $5 million. They were planning on mounting a big budget feature film version of the character that would have been able to go head to head with Tim Burton's Batman franchise. They hired James Cameron to come on board to write, direct, and produce the film. The rough budget was set at a high price tag of $50 million. As Cameron neared completion on True Lies, he started gearing up for Spidey. James Cameron's Spider-Man would be presented to Carol Co. as a 47-page script mint. What's a script mint, you might ask? Well, it's a very detailed outline that's half script and half overview of the story. Cameron's story had a much darker and angsty tone to it than the final Sam Raimi film. It features swearing, hyperviolence, and even Peter Parker pseudo-stalking Mary Jane with his newfound super abilities. The story centers on a surprisingly traditional origin story that then evolves into Spidey going head-to-head -head with garbled versions of Electro and Sandman. Cameron Scriptman seems to do a pretty good job of updating the classic Lee and Ditko Spider-Man origin for the 1990s. Peter is a nerd. He's into photography and science. Eventually, he gets paired up with Mary Jane Watson on a homework assignment, causing all the teen romantic comedy and unrequited love that you'd want in a Spidey story. Just like in the comics, he goes to a science exhibit, gets bit by a spider, and then gains spider powers. Cameron even takes the teen hijinks and amps it up to 11 by depicting Peter waking up the next morning covered in white organically produced web fluid. That's right, he's all about organic web shooters. Throughout the script mint, Cameron seems determined to mine the intensity and rawness of being a teenager. He pushes the anger and sexuality in directions that might not always look like they would have worked at face value. This flies in the face of the Spider-Man we all know and love from the comics. Peter's constant struggle in life is balancing a home life, paying rent, and being the superhero New York needs him to be. While the script mint has some hints at that, it also has a bizarrely try-hard air about it. It wants to be edgy more than it wants to be a good Spider-Man story. Similarly to the source material, Peter is being raised by Aunt May and Uncle Ben, who are kindly but slightly out of touch older people. After Ben is laid off from his job, Peter starts attempting to make money as a street performer and local TV show personality. Just like in the classic origin with the wrestling promoter, Peter gets an entertainment agent to handle the money he's making from his appearances. However, he gets screwed over. Then Uncle Ben dies in a carjacking and Spider-Man tracks down the criminal, finding out that it's all his fault with great power does, in fact, come great responsibility. This is where the Cameron script mint starts to diverge significantly from the comics. Peter becomes embroiled in a plot where a rich businessman named Carlton Strand attempts to sway Peter into working for him, ostensibly as a full-time criminal. Strand has the ability to channel electricity. If this sounds familiar, it's because he's essentially just a very boring hybrid of Kroger's brand Kingpin and flea market Electro but with all the potentially interesting elements of those two characters sanded away. Speaking of sand, the heavy in the film is a character named Boyd, who's got the ability to turn himself into Sandman. He's just Sandman, but again, with none of the backstory or character of Kane Marco. He's just a dude with sand powers. In the finale of the script mint, Spider-Man defeats Carlton Strand and dumps a massive bag of money over Manhattan. Believe it or not, there's even a sequence in the script that features Spidey and MJ having intimate relations on the Brooklyn Bridge. The aspect that doesn't quite communicate in a summary of the script mint is just how weirdly filled with cursing it is. 
like Peter and the other characters say curse words throughout the whole thing. There's also some drug use, a significant quotient of over-the-top violence, and a subplot that revolves all around Mary Jane being caught in an abusive relationship. Would the final film have still featured these elements? That's anyone's guess. Treatments and outlines often feature aspects that are discarded before filming. It's clear that Cameron is trying to make a sexier, more Melrose Place version of a Spider-Man mythology. But it doesn't feel right. Spider-Man should be a morality play not an edgy teen soap opera. James Cameron's Spider-Man film never made it further than this scriptment. Despite rumors of both Leo DiCaprio and Arnold Schwarzenegger's involvement, the project died due to extended litigation. Golan and Cameron were both contractually granted producer credits and Carol Co. couldn't get anyone to budge. Thus, lawsuits, battles over financials, and at one point, a Carol Co. exec literally just phoning up Menachem Golan and point-blank asking him to just not take a credit so they could just move forward with the picture played out throughout the seedy back alleys of Hollywood. Obviously, this didn't happen, and so lawsuits were filed in 1993. Golan sued Carol Co. Carol Co. sued Viacom and Columbia because it turned out that the contract that they bought from Golan only allowed for the feature film rights, and of course, the other two studios countersued. To make things even weirder, Fox, wanting to stay in the James Cameron business, contested Cameron's involvement in Spider-Man, saying that he was under contract to them exclusively. Long story short, it was a mess. And it obviously sank any hopes of a Cameron written and produced Spider-Man film. Even through all the lawsuit chatter, the fan press and Hollywood were convinced that Leo was going to play Peter Parker. So the question is how close did we get to actually having Leo on the big screen thwipping around? According to him, not very. In an Empire Magazine interview, DiCaprio said he was not very close, but there was a screenplay. But according to Cameron, when talking to Screen Crush, he was very serious about making the film. Superheroes in general always came off as kind of fanciful to me. And believe it or not, the film came closer to existence than anyone probably thinks. Cameron went so far as to lobby Fox to purchase them the rights in the late 90s. I tried to get Fox to buy it, but apparently the rights were a little bit clouded. Former Fox president Peter Chernin just wouldn't go to bat for it. If that doesn't show you James Cameron's artistic and business vision, nothing will. However, this version of the Spider-Man mythology seems to be better as a link in the chain that eventually resulted in the finished Raimi film than as its own project. The tone of the scriptment is very angry and aggressive in a way that doesn't work for Spider-Man. And the fact that it's not referential to anything in the Spider-Man world other than his origin doesn't sit well. However, the most important element of this scriptment that eventually made its way into David Kep's Spider-Man screenplay that no one talks about? Organic web shooters. Whoa! That came out of you. Yeah. That's right, the organic webs that Peter discovers himself covered in waking up, they manifest throughout the movie as organic web shooters. Their inclusion in the Raimi film can be traced directly back to James Cameron. Well, that's all we have for this episode. What do you guys think? Would this James Cameron Spider-Man have been better than the Raimi version? Let us know down in the comments below and make sure to like and subscribe for more nerdstalgic videos just like this.